Hello, and welcome to the Community IT Innovators Technology Topics Podcast, where we discuss nonprofit technology, cybersecurity, tech project implementation, strategic planning, and nonprofit IT careers. Find us at communityit.com. Hello, and welcome to the September 2018 Community IT Innovators Webinar. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar on Office 365 Security Best Practices. My name is Johan Hammerstrom, and I'm the President and CEO of Community IT. I'm the moderator for this webinar series, and I'll also be a co-presenter on today's webinar. Before we begin, we'd like to tell you a little bit more about our company. Community IT is a 100% employee-owned company, and our team of nearly 40 staff is dedicated to helping nonprofit organizations advance their missions through the effective use of technology. We are technology experts, and we have been consistently named a top 200 North American managed services provider by MSP Mentor, and it's an honor we received in 2017. Thank you for joining us today, and we're really looking forward to reviewing Office 365 best practices with you. So I've introduced myself. I'd like to uh, give, our, give my co-presenter a chance to introduce himself as well. Great. Thanks, Johan. Um, so my name is Matt Eshelman. I'm the Chief Technology Officer uh, at Community IT. Uh, looking forward to talking about um, some security best practices uh, in Office 365, uh, and I'm actually looking forward to going to the Microsoft Conference, uh, which is going to be next week, uh, and kind of learning, uh, continue to learn more about this kind of ever-changing field. Great. So let's uh, take a look at the agenda for today's webinar. So we're going to start off by talking about the current threat landscape. And I think one of the things that we've really noticed over the last 18 months or so is that the threats faced by organizations have really changed dramatically. And a lot of that has been a result of organizations moving to the cloud. But the, um, the nature of attacks and breaches is very different from just two years ago. And the things that organizations need to do to protect themselves um, has also changed as a result of that. And so we're going to talk a little bit about the current threat landscape and what the biggest threats are, just statistically, um, for small and mid-sized nonprofit organizations. We're going to talk about uh, today's webinar is focused on Office 365, and we are going to focus on um, the things that can be done in Office 365 uh, to secure information. And we're going to talk a little bit about why that really is, if you're in Office 365, really the best place for you to focus um, your security energy, your time, and your and your priorities. Um, specifically, because we're talking about Office 365, we're going to run through a lot of the features, the tools that Microsoft provides, but we're also going to talk about the licensing. And you really can't talk about the tools that are available in Office 365 without also considering the licensing framework that Microsoft uses to, to provide those tools. It's not simple, it's not straightforward, but um, we've got some great resources that can explain how that all works that I think you'll find really helpful. Um, from there, we have a security checklist that we wanna walk through with you, and this is a checklist that you can use at your organizations um, to start securing your information in Office 365 right away. And then finally, we're gonna talk about some um, dashboards uh, and some scorecards that Microsoft has provided that'll help you to assess your, your own um, security readiness. All right, so without further ado, let's talk a little bit about the changes that we've seen in the threat landscape. So um, what we're seeing today is that these three types of information are the most targeted. So email, and we've got some stats that we're going to show you in a second. But email, logins, and files are the information that right now hackers are going after more than anything else. And this is why Office 365 has become such a big target, because most organizations that have Office 365 are taking advantage of Exchange Online. They're using 
um, some form of uh, credential and login to Office 365, um, generally Azure AD, to access their information. And increasingly, organizations are storing files in uh, OneDrive for business, in SharePoint. And so organizations are being targeted in these three areas. And so my Office 365 itself has become uh, a major target um, of, uh, of hackers. It also has something to do with the fact that Microsoft has such a big market share. So it's a huge surface area. And so hackers, instead of going after a smaller percentage of information that might be in third-party solutions like Dropbox, if they just focus their efforts on Office 365, there's just a huge amount of users and customers that they can, that they can go after. So specifically, um, these are some, some current statistics of, that explain why attacks are so successful. And um, th there's a whole other uh, series of, of um, slides that we presented in a previous webinar that sort of talk about the mindset of hackers. And in general, most hackers are small-time criminals. You may be in an organization that has enemies that are targeting you. But in general, most of the attacks that occur uh, on the internet, in the cloud, on Office 365, are the result of you know small-scale criminal enterprise. And the reason they do it is because it's successful, and there's a financial payoff you know for for launching a successful attack. So why are attacks so successful? Well, 30% of users open email from attackers. That seems like a really high number, but um, that's what that's the industry that's what the industry is noting right now. And so that um, could mean anything from a phishing attack uh, to you know one of the wire transfer fake wire transfer attacks that I think we're all familiar with. But 30% of those attacks are are successful in the sense that the emails are opened, and 10% of those attacks. Um, result in a link being clicked on or an attachment being opened. And yeah, Matt, go ahead. Yeah, and I was going to say, I mean, and this is the you know the research from Microsoft, and I think our practical experience, you know, also bears us out as we do security awareness training with our you know with our clients or you know uh, you know we're seeing these numbers as well. You know, uh, you know, kind of anywhere from you know five percent if an organization has you know very attentive staff. Uh, you know, I think on up into the, you know, 30 and even 40%, uh, you know, of, or, of people falling for a, a, a potentially malicious link. So, uh, so I think the numbers are surprisingly high. Uh, and again, it kind of points out why these attacks are so successful. In addition to, I think the, you know, people clicking on links that they shouldn't have, uh, the research also shows that you know, the vast majority of passwords themselves used in attacks are, are either weak, they're using the defaults, uh, or, or they're stolen in other breaches. And this points to an issue of uh, password reuse uh, that we really want to focus on uh, helping our users make good decisions and choosing strong passwords that aren't used for every single site that they, uh, that they, that they go on. And then, you know, finally, in terms of why attacks are so successful is that, you know, in general, people just, you know, 50% of users share information inadvertently. I mean, it could be uh, including the wrong person on an email, maybe that contains sensitive board information, uh, or maybe attaching the wrong document that contained private information instead of the cleaned up version. So you know, there's a couple of different ways in terms of how information can leave an organization uh, that, you know, can also contribute to uh, how, you know, data can be compromised, uh, and somebody who shouldn't have access to information gains access to information. And, and these numbers really emphasize why these attacks are so lucrative and why and the incentives you know that exist for hackers to uh, pursue these attacks if only you can imagine the millions and millions of email addresses that are out there on office 365 and you know 10 percent <laughs> of a million is a hundred thousand and that's a huge payout you know if, if you're getting people to uh, commit wire transfer fraud or if you're able to, you know, install malware on their machines or gain, you know, their credentials and therefore access to their systems. So it's, uh, you know, these numbers and, you know, my guess is that in your organization, you're going to see at least these numbers. Um, but if you, if your organization hasn't 
focused on security, you'll probably see numbers that are higher than this. At least that's been that's been our experience. So mm -hmm. um, there's a there's a big there's a big need out there. Um, we've become aware of incidents at our at our clients um, when something dramatic happens. So either there is an illegal wire transfer, a fraudulent wire transfer that gets made, or someone's email has been hacked and is used to send out thousands of embarrassing emails. Um, strange things start happening with their documents or their email. Those are how we and, and, our, and our customers sort of um, become aware that their systems have been compromised. But in reality, the system has probably been compromised long before we became aware of it. And the industry sort of standard or the industry research shows that in, on average, it only takes hackers four minutes from launching an attack to access a network, but it takes over 99 days for businesses to discover that they've been breached. So the flip side of um, the, the high incidence of attacks being successful is that people don't realize that they've been hacked until it's until it's too late and so it's really important to pursue preventive security measures in advance um, don't wait until you get hacked because you may not know that you've been hacked you may be hacked now and and not realize it yeah i would say that often happens if you know we respond to a breach we have a known user account that's been compromised and in doing kind of the breach remediation response uh, you know, it's not uncommon to find another account or other accounts that have also been uh, compromised, but maybe the user hadn't hadn't quite realized it yet. So, uh, yes, um, yeah, for all of this, you know, prevention is is key because the remediation and the follow up, uh, you know, can take a lot of time and and um, you know be rather you know kind of painful. Yeah. So enough of the scare tactics. I mean, you're you you are all on this webinar. You're listening to this webinar because you recognize the importance of security and probably share the concerns that we have around uh, vulnerabilities. So the good news is that Microsoft has all, is also very aware of these vulnerabilities and has uh, built and deployed a large number of tools that can be used to help secure your Microsoft Office 365 tenant. And so the rest of the webinar we're not, we could go through, we could spend an hour talking about scary things that happen uh, with, with hackers on the internet, but we really want to focus on what you can do to protect yourself. So we've really uh, focused a lot of our attention on these tools as opposed to third-party tools, although we also avail ourselves of a number of third-party tools and they're important to use. But I, if you're going to focus in one area, at least initially, uh, we really think that 365's security tools are the place to start uh, for a variety of reasons. One, it's very simple. Chances are you have a lot of different information systems uh, either in Office 365 or already connected to Office 365. And as a result, you know, there's a tight integration between your existing deployment and the tools that Microsoft provides. And it also, um, you know, makes it makes it uh, easier to use those tools. Um, generally, and this is specific, particularly true for nonprofit organizations, the tools that Microsoft provides you with are going to be a lot less expensive. And security software, the whole sort of, um, you know, solution space of, of security solutions remains quite a bit more expensive. Uh, and I won't go into the reasons behind that, but in general, you're going to be paying a premium for security solutions and my you know sense is that microsoft's pricing is not you know out of um proportion you know to the solution just even for businesses and then when you add in a lot of the discounts that they provide to nonprofit organizations it becomes very affordable so um in general it's a very cost effective way uh to to deploy good security solutions and then Microsoft, you know, kind of famously is, is, you know, really in tune with the business needs of its customers. And they continue to refine and revise these tools so that they really align with the business goals of the organization. 
So for all of those reasons, uh, we really have a lot of confidence in Microsoft's um, Office 365 uh, security tools. So the two main things, you know, and we're going to we're going to get into a lot more. We're going to get into the weeds here shortly and talk about a lot of the granular tools that Microsoft makes available, but they all sort of fall into these two main categories of uh, security. And one is safeguarding your data and the other is monitoring your monitoring your data. Um, we've got some more, you know, statistics here. Um, according, Verizon does this amazing uh, security and it's basically a breach investigations report um, every year and they they um, they basically compile all the information that they collect in investigating breaches both their own and for their customers and they sort of highlight common features of breaches and what they found is that 81 percent of all hacking bre breaches use compromised credentials so that means you know I think the the popular opinion of hacking is that you have, you know, what you see in the movies is, you know, some genius hacker uh, has a special program and it kind of runs through, it does a brute force attack and in some clever way it sort of hacks into the system. When the reality is most hackers are using compromised credentials, that is credentials that have been uh, revealed in some way that are well known and they can use those existing credentials to hack into the database. What that means is if you are securing your credentials and keeping them safe, then you're you know, present, preventing yourself from you know, 81% of, of all of the hacking that, that happens. So it's really important that credentials be kept safe, that you limit the widespread use of credentials, um, that you use multi-factor authentication. And we had a webinar last year that went into more detail on multi-factor authentication. Uh, quick quick sort of review of what it is. It's um, something you have. So the password is something you know, and the second factor is something you have. And in general these days, it's uh, either a code that gets texted to you or a code that shows up on an app that you have on your smartphone. The value of multi-factor is that if someone steals your username and password, if they don't have your phone, they're not going to be able to log into your account because they need that code that only exists with the thing that you have. And, you know, in general, most security professionals agree that multi-factor authentication is the way to uh, prevent, you know, credential related hacking. So we'll talk more about how to implement that in Office 365. And then finally, you know, making sure that non-compliant devices uh, can't access your overall system. So there's a lot, there's all, all these things you can do in Office 365 to safeguard and protect your data. But then there are also some great tools for monitoring data. Um, so you can uh, monitor who's logging in, where they're logging in from, um, looking for logins that aren't you know, that are suspicious in nature and responding to those quickly. And um, there's one other um, statistic here uh, that related to the credentials. 75% of all individuals use only three or four passwords across all of their accounts. That is a huge problem. And, and the main reason for it is that once those uh, passwords uh, are in a system that gets hacked, they're released, if you will, into the wild and they show up on the dark web. And there's basically a huge, huge databases of known passwords uh, all over the internet. And it doesn't take long for hackers to run through those known combinations. And so we've uh, seen firsthand a number of cases where, um, you know, the, the Office 365 account was protected and, you know, no one hacked it, but, um, someone was using a username and password that they were also using for their personal Yahoo email, that they were also using for their Dropbox account, that they were maybe using in third-party forums. And as we know, Dropbox, Yahoo, and you know, third parties have all been hacked over the, the last five or six years, and all of those hacked credentials are now available. And so if you were using the same username and password for Dropbox that you're using for Office 365, should probably assume that someone has, you know, found a way to, to log into it. So um, some of this boils down to training and, you know, this webinar again is focused on tools and 
that is not meant to, uh, you know, to um, downplay the importance of training. So training is critical in all of this. Um, but many of the tools that we're going to talk about can help, you know, alleviate some of the challenges um, that occur right now with credentials. So let's talk about those tools. And no discussion of Microsoft and Microsoft software would be complete without a similar discussion of Office 365 licensing. <laughs> Thanks, Johan. Uh, yes, so uh, we're going to take a look here at kind of the laundry list of um, different features and kind of talk about the uh, associated license that goes along with it. And actually, before we get to that, I'm going to do a quick sort of all, like a visual glossary of terms uh, so that hopefully clarifies how all these things fit together. So uh, a feature is some software that Microsoft makes available. So for this example, I'm going to use Professional Plus, and it's here in a box, although I, I, I don't think anyone goes out anymore and buys boxes of software. You know, you download it from the Internet. Um, but let's say Office Professional Plus is the Office suite of software, and that's a feature that you want to avail yourself of. You want to use Microsoft Office on the desktop. In order to do that, you have to purchase a license for it. And Microsoft includes the license for Office Professional Plus with the Office 365 subscription. So if you have Office 365 E3, that subscription includes a bundle of licenses, one of which is Office Professional Plus. If, however, you have Office 365 E1, your subscription does not include that license. But to make matters more complicated, you can go out and buy that license a la carte. So if you have E3, it includes this license. If you have E1, it doesn't, but you can still go out and buy the license separately. So Matt's going to go through a list of the different um, features, and features are basically different you know, software solutions that are available in Office 365. And then we'll talk about which bundles you know, what the licensing that's needed to run that feature, and then which bundles include that licensing. Great. All right, so this chart here uh, represents a list of the features that we're going to leverage in Office 365 to improve the default security settings. So um, for each feature, I've outlined the license that it requires, and then what subscription bundle that it's a part of. So Microsoft continues to evolve these solutions. And so while uh, this list is accurate as of you know September 2018, uh, it certainly will change. Um, and then the other lesson that I've learned is that if there's some new cool feature that you see, uh, it's likely going to require a new or a different license. So um, Let's just kind of talk through these features quickly, and I'll provide an overview of them and, and some of the licensing. So uh, Cloud MFA, so that's the ability uh, from Microsoft's perspective to log into Office 365 with multi-factor authentication. That's actually included in Office 365. It's part of all Office 365 subscriptions. And so uh, you could probably go ahead and turn that on now uh, so that you can uh, enable multi-factor authentication for your Office, uh, for that Office uh, suite what uh, I'm terming granular multi-factor authentication um, or the ability to, for example, exempt having to use multi-factor authentication when you're in your office locations um, or having some other uh, controls, you know, multi-factor with, with single sign-on, um, that requires Azure Active Directory P1, um, which is part of the EM plus S E3 bundle. Uh, if you want to be able to do password write back, so for example, if you are using uh, Azure AD Connect to connect your on-premise Active Directory to Azure Active Directory. Uh, you can actually turn on password write back so people can do uh, self-service password resets um, through the cloud. Also requires Azure AD P1, part of EMS E3. Uh, if you are interested in enabling some DLP or data loss prevention, so for example, you wanted to set a policy saying, hey, we want to we're HIPAA, we have HIPAA compliance, we want to make sure that we're not sending any PII uh, through our email. Um, that would require the use of uh, a DLP 
feature that's part of Exchange P2, which is part of that Office 365 E3 bundle. So again, it's not available in E1. Um, if you are looking at um, some additional security um, around the identity, so turning on features like flagging logins from suspicious IPs or uh, impossible travel times or some other kind of advanced security features, that is a, a function of Azure AD P2, uh, which is a part of the EMS E5 subscription. Um, if you wanted to turn on email uh, or file encryption, um, that requires Azure uh, RMS or Rights Management Service. That's part of E3, Office 365 E3. Uh, if you're interested in cloud app security, uh, so that's a kind of a, a newer offering from Microsoft that looks at the applications that people are using on the web, some policies uh, and kind of user rights assignment or uh, different features in terms of you know how uh, people are interacting with the systems. Uh, that requires a separate license. Uh, it's a standalone license. Uh, but it's also a part of the EMS E5 bundle. Um, if you wanted to enable single sign-on, so uh, so you could log in with your Office 365 credentials and then integrate other web applications like Salesforce or Dropbox or Box, uh, that requires Azure AD P1, uh, which is part of EMS E3. And if you wanted to do some computer management, maybe uh, enroll devices in management, set some different policies, uh, force BitLocker, for example, uh, that requires Intune, and uh, Intune is part of the EMS E3 bundle. So uh, the short answer for all of this stuff is, you know, you need EMS E3 uh, or E5 so the, to, to enable a lot of these features. Yeah, that's and that's also good news um, that a lot of these great features, the multi-factor authentication, data loss prevention, which is a really cool feature that prevents, you know, credit card numbers and social security numbers from being inadvertently sent uh, out through email. Um, those features are almost almost all of these features are essentially included in something you already have or something that is very affordable to get, which is oh, it's a dramatic reveal there. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so this would be yeah. Go ahead, Matt. Yeah, our, our kind of recommended uh, SKUs for getting signed up in Office 365. So ideally, you would have Office 365 E3. Um, so the charity pricing for that is 450 a month per user, uh, and that would include your Exchange Online, SharePoint, OneDrive, kind of all the DLP features, and uh, your desktop Office software for five devices. Uh, you wouldn't get you would get EMS E3, which Microsoft has recently moved to provide 50 free licenses, uh, which is fantastic. Um, and then beyond that, uh, it is 225 a month. The E5 subscription is kind of a relatively new addition for Microsoft, um, and that is $6 a month per user account. Uh, we also, as we're kind of getting this stuff set up, uh, encourage organizations to take advantage of the Azure um, nonprofit sponsorship subscription, which provides an annual credit of $5,000 at Azure. Now, a lot of the stuff that we're talking about is actually all kind of under the Office 365 umbrella, not the Azure umbrella, um, but you'll still, you know, kind of log into Azure and, and, and access some reporting there. And it's just kind of handy to have a subscription um, already in place so that you don't have to, uh, you know, set up a subscription and then apply for this later and then try to merge them. Uh, so it's easy just to set up at the very beginning. Um, and then again, you could add in cloud app security again for either $1.25 a month uh, or uh, include it as part of the EMS E5 license. So just a quick point of clarification, Matt, is Azure AD, so you see here, some of these require Azure AD, is that part of Azure or is that it looks like that's part of EM, EM plus S. Right, so uh, I think that's a good point of clarification. So there's actually, I think there's there's four uh, different tiers of Azure Active Directory. So any account that you have in Office 365, that account actually resides in Azure Active Directory. So if you just have Office 365, I think it's you know like the, the basic offering, that is what they call the free tier. Uh, then if you have, uh, you know, E3, that is what's called the the basic tier, which gives you some, you know, some features or some capabilities to kind of 
So if you have E3, you could log in to Azure Active or to Azure Active Directory right now, and you would see a list of accounts. You wouldn't be able to do much with it, but you would you would see the accounts there. Uh, once you add on the Azure AD Premium, that P1 license, so P1 is is part of that EMS E3 bundle, then you can start. Uh, getting some more security features and reporting. Uh, and then the P2 uh, bundle, which is part of the EMS E5, uh, then that kind of turns on even more security features. So uh, you kind of go from like, yeah, free, basic P1, P2. Hmm. Thanks for that. Yeah, that's, that could be a whole nother webinar. <laughs> <laughs> the finer points of Azure Active Directory, yes. Yes, and uh, and and to be clear, as the Azure sponsorship refers to kind of a different. Set yeah, I mean the Azure sponsorship. Altogether. Yeah, I mean that that covers things like if you were going to set up a, a virtual server, if you wanted to use some storage, uh, if you were going to build some web applications, um, that that would be the thing that uh, would would count against your Azure sponsorship subscription. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of yeah, from a cost perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you for for going into those details. Um, so, uh, one of the options is, um, you know, why? So, actually, it would be helpful for me to cue this up on the pricing slide. So, uh, one option is to just go with Office 365 E3 and then get your EM Plus S E3, and the total cost there for 50 or less is 450 a month. Another option could be you go with E1 and you get the Office Pro Plus for your desktop office suite and EM Plus S, and that's going to be $3 a month. So you're saving $1.50 per, per user per month. Um, there are some things that E3 provides that would not be included in that scenario, um, aside from just the simplicity of getting the one you know, the one SKU. Um, and those include uh, information protection, the data loss prevention that we talked about is not included in this bundle, this sort of homemade bundle. Um, E3 includes unlimited email storage, and you also have the option to put mailboxes on litigation hold uh, in case you have any sort of, you know, um, capstone staff that you need to retain their email for a long time. So, um, we tend to recommend, you know, just paying the extra dollar fifty per month and going with E3. Um, there's some simplicity there in that approach, and you also get these additional features. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then there's a link here that that kind of describes all the plan options and and kind of fundamentally the difference between E1 and E3 is is on the the actual exchange package that's included. So, um, yeah, yeah. So there's so E3 straightforward. Go for it. All right, so let's get into the practical. Uh, if if you're interested, if you're like, this looks pretty affordable, I'm in Office 365, what can I do to get started securing my, my tenant and my implementation? Um, we're gonna talk about that in more detail and kind of run through a couple checklists that uh, we, we suggest you, you start to follow. Mm -hmm. Great. And as I go through these things, uh, please feel free to chat in uh, any questions. We'll take them kind of as, as they come, and we hopefully we'll have a few minutes here at the end of the presentation as well. So uh, in terms of security checklist, um, the very first place that I would recommend starting is with the Secure Score. So Secure Score is uh, an app that Office 365 um, has available that gives you kind of a baseline um, uh, security score and our security kind of checklist is rooted in this secure score. So once you have a, taken a look at that uh, secure score, the next step would be to go ahead and turn on auditing uh, in the Office 365 Protection Center. So Microsoft has a lot of content uh, that it can collect, but it's something that you off, that you have to enable uh, as part of uh, as you know kind of part of the their. Uh, uh, process. Microsoft is really bringing a lot of reporting into the Protection Center, including that uh, exchange message trace. So again, if you ever needed to find out yeah, who sent who a message and didn't get delivered, uh, that's actually being pulled into the Security Center, uh, Protection Center. Um, so now that you've looked at some of the built-in features that you kind of already have, uh, it's time to add on some services. So starting with that EM plus S licensing that 
pricing, as I mentioned, uh, has already has now been updated to include 50 free licenses uh, as a separate kind of standalone SKU, and additional licenses are 225 per user per month. Uh, and the link to that uh, is actually at the end of the presentation, which has some additional details. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the other service that we'd recommend signing up for is the Azure Sponsorship, and this is the annual $5,000 service credit for Azure services. It is renewable, um, so it's not kind of a one-time thing, but it is renewable. Um, and as you said, a lot of these security services are under this Office 365 umbrella, not Azure. Um, however, it's kind of convenient to have that Azure subscription because as you look at some of the reporting uh, and the integration with your on-prem directories, uh, that's kind of all on the Azure side. Uh, and then finally, uh, for some advanced insight and that custom reporting, you can link your Azure Active Directory with Power BI. Um, so Power BI you know, uses a free subscription, so there's not actually an additional cost for that service. So we're kind of talking about check out the SCARE score, turn on some auditing, kind of get some of these other uh, tools in place. Yeah, this is a great list, and this is a good place to start, and we're gonna go into some more detail on each of these, uh, provide some more guidance on what to do. And this list will be, uh, we post all of our webinar slides to our SlideShare account, and the links are posted on our website and also get sent out after the webinar. So um, you can screenshot this, you can download the presentation from SlideShare, and we'll also include all of these uh, web links um, in the notes, uh, in the show notes, as they say, um, on our SlideShare account. Uh, and just as an aside, the recording is also available on our YouTube, YouTube channel, and that will get posted as well. So let's talk about Secure Score. Mm -hmm. Yep, so Secure Score uh, is an app that's available to everyone. Um, and it will provide you with a numeric score based on your currently configured environment. So it'll also provide you with a detailed list of steps to implement. Um, I really like Secure Score because it actually shows your progress over time, and it and um, it also includes an evolving set of recommendations and settings based on the new features that Microsoft adds or new capabilities, and then also the new threats um, that are identified. So uh, this is kind of a good um, you know base baseline and benchmarking tool that's available to help provide some guidance in terms of, hey, you know, there's lots of threats out there. Uh, what are the things that are important for me to do? So here we've got uh, a screenshot of a secure score. This is what it looks like. Um, so for this organization, they have a score of 115 out of 360. I think most uh, kind of nonprofit clients that we start working with are kind of down in the 30s. Uh, that's kind of where you start at. Um, and again, you can see here through the portal, it gives you uh, a score for your Office 365 environment. You can turn on and get some integration with uh, desktop or with you know desktop in terms of your uh, you know with Windows Defender. Um, but then here we've got some identified the portal identifies some workflows and uh, an updated risk assessment. So this organization has been identified as having a high risk of attack in the areas of account breach or privilege escalation uh, and also data exfiltration. That's pretty scary. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this is a good tool that uh, if you have Office 365, you have access to this tool. It's pretty easy to set up and run, and it gives you a good starting point. And if you're, you know, oftentimes, um, you know, you, you can run this prior to making these additional purchases. This can be a great tool for getting executive buy-in. You know, you, you turn this out, and if, if you are at around 30, you can say, oof, we are at a pretty high risk of something happening. You can take it to your senior leadership and you know use it to to get some support for some security initiatives. All right. So once you have your secure score, you can move on to uh, this this checklist. Yeah. So as I mentioned, the steps in our kind of this admin security checklist are, are kind of fundamentally rooted in that secure score roadmap. And these are, uh, I think, what we found to be kind of the most meaningful and relevant uh, controls to implement. You know, there's, there's a lot you can do in security and it can kind of be daunting to start. So these are kind of the core steps that we would take. Uh, whenever we're setting up or securing an Office 365 tenant. So the first is to have between two and five global admins. So these are the uh, accounts that kind of have the keys to the castle, so to speak. So you want to have two, so you have a backup account. Um, and then the guidance is to not have more than five, um, just so you don't have too many people with too much access to your system. 
Um, the second step would be to turn on multi-factor authentication for everyone. Uh, this is an easy step to do uh, and is really the best tool that we have in our arsenal to really combat this kind of raft of uh, credential theft and account compromise. Uh, once you get MFA turned on, uh, then we would recommend really focusing on encouraging and working with staff to create complex passwords. Um, so these would be passwords that would be, you know, at least eight characters with Office 365, no more than 16. Um, but uh, something that is unique, not used somewhere else, not their, you know, name with a one added onto it, um, but something that's easy to remember, that's lengthy and uh, is not reused. Uh, the carrot, I think, with the complex password can be uh, also the fact that once you've turned on multi-factor, once you've implemented good passwords, then there's actually not a need to, to change them on a regular basis. So security research has shown that uh, whenever people are forced to change their password on a you know 90-day basis or whatever uh, regular basis, they actually don't choose new good passwords. They kind of just choose bad passwords or, or kind of modify existing bad passwords. Um, and so this can be a little bit of the carrot uh, with your staff whenever they've been made to go through this multi-factor authentication enrollment can be like, hey, we do the multi-factor, pay a good password. I'm not gonna ask you to change your password again. So again, a little bit of a carrot and stick approach there. Yeah, and I think that's a good point because that's a great example of how the conventional wisdom is kind of changing. And, you know, the previous conventional wisdom was you got to change your password every 90 days for it to be secure. And I think, you know, the, the studies and the, you know, the, the analysis of incidents show that if you have a, a, a password that's unique to Office 365 and you have multi-factor, you don't really need to change it um, that often. You need to change, your staff should be changing it now uh, if they haven't ever changed it or haven't changed it in a long time. But once they do that, then, you know, they're, they're in pretty good shape. Um, now, these things are all simple to turn on on an administrative, from an administrative, technical administrative standpoint. Um, there's a whole change management aspect to implementing these changes that is not necessarily trivial. And that's where that executive buy-in is critical. And that's where the secure score um, report can really be helpful. Mm -hmm. Great. So once we've got the account set up, now we can uh, talk about doing kind of some security on the platform. Uh, so one would be to turn on that DLP and Office 365. I think this we found this to be really uh, valuable to turn on some of the predefined templates that Microsoft has provided to you know, flag and identify documents that contain personally identifiable information or financial information, you know, bank accounts, credit cards, that kind of thing. Um, and so those controls can be audited first just to kind of see what's going on and then they can actually be activated so that it will proactively block that information and provide feedback to staff uh, if they found to, to kind of make the, if they're found to, to be sending information that they shouldn't be. Um, moving on from enabling some of the DLP in Office 365 would be to configuring some uh, additional uh, tools around securing email. So SPF may be a familiar acronym uh, as a way to kind of validate and help cut down on spoofing and spam. Uh, the new acronyms of DMARC and DKIM are also um, kind of related to tools and techniques that can help provide domain verification and validation so that the message that you receive uh, is sure to be from uh, the, the sender that you think it is. So, you know, we're all receiving messages that are spoofed that appear to be coming from somebody within the organization that's not, uh, and it can be very tricky to determine. So DKIM, DMARC, DKIM uh, are additional tools in this regard. Um, in our admin security checklist, we do also uh, have started to look at requiring disk encryption as part of our best practice. Uh, if you're an organization, uh, for example, that has PCI or HIPAA compliance, you may already be doing this. Um, and I'll just kind of make a plug for the Intune portion uh, of that EMS uh, license. It really makes managing and enrolling computers in disk encryption fairly straightforward. Um, you know, I actually just have a new computer. Uh, I turned it on, I enrolled in Azure Active Directory, uh, and then my computer kind of automatically configured disk encryption, stored my recovery key in my cloud account, uh, and kind of I'm off, I'm off to the races. So uh, that's a really powerful tool 
uh, that can really provide a lot of security, particularly if you're dealing with that uh, personally identifiable information, uh, it can really help cut down on that reporting requirement if a laptop gets lost or stolen. You know, if it's encrypted, uh, you, uh, you know, it makes it a lot easier to, to deal with those uh, requests. Um, and then finally, you know, these are all, there's lots of great security tools. We've turned on lots of auditing. We've done all this other stuff, but uh, it's important to actually spend some time and focus on actually reviewing the audit data. It's part of my, uh, you know, daily security practice is to review the reports and information to make sure that uh, our networks are secure. Um, and the tools are, are pretty powerful to make that, you know, meaningful and relevant. So it's not, you know, hours and hours uh, looking through logs, but the, the the security tools are really surfacing the relevant uh, information. Great. So these are the things that you can start doing right away or plan to do um, once you, you know, basically obtain your your EM plus S uh, licensing uh, as a nonprofit. Um, we have some questions coming in, Matt, but I think we'll wait till the end. We'll have a Q&A time at the end because we still have a, a, a number of important slides to, to move through. So we have some questions on this slide, but we'll I promise we'll come back to those at the end. Great. All right. So these are what the admins can do. What about the staff, end users? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So again, lots of this content is geared towards, you know, folks who are IT managers. If, if you're not an IT manager, but uh, you know, you're interested in good security for yourself, I think the best thing that you can do is pick a strong password and one that's unique for each service. Again, we've seen a lot of breaches, um, you know, probably starting three or four months ago, uh, it corresponded to a number of kind of well-publicized data breaches that included lots of passwords. Um, and so it seems like those are out there. So pick a strong password, pick a unique password, you know, using a password manager tool like LastPass can really help with that in terms of generating unique passwords you don't have to really think about. Um, so that if, you know, solution A gets compromised, uh, that doesn't then immediately provide access to solution B. Um, the other thing is I'll say is just be cautious when clicking. You know, as we identified at the very beginning, you know, 10% of people are clicking on malicious links from people they don't know. Um, and so good browsing habits and just kind of smart IT habits are really helpful in reducing the risk of the organization. You know, report you know, suspicious activity to your IT team. I mean, this is, you know, kind of the rule of an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure is particularly apt in this situation. You know, we encourage all of our clients, if you have a suspicious email, forward it to the help desk. We'll take a look at it, you know, and help you make that determination. If it looks suspicious, we'll just delete it. And, you know, if it's not and we think it's okay, you know, hey, you had to wait a few minutes to, to validate an email. Um, but that's a lot better uh, approach than, clicking on something, then asking if it was uh, malicious. So, um, you know, fortunately the tools that we have in auditing, we'll, you know, if somebody does click on something, we're able to kind of go back and audit and report on uh, kind of what happened, maybe when the account was compromised, what steps need to be taken uh, as part of a response. Um, you know, but again, if you're an end user, ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure in this case. Yeah, and I, I mean, that last point, we can't emphasize enough. I think in, in many of the situations, um, that we've dealt with, uh, the organization became aware that they were hacked because something just seemed funny to one of the staff and they, they reported on it. But, you know, it's not like ultimately hackers are sneaky, you know, and their goal is to tr not to attract attention. But oh, there are a lot of amateur hackers out there that are also clumsy. And so you kind of combine the sneakiness with the clumsiness and you end up with just things that don't seem quite right. So that's where training is so valuable because if you're training your staff, they'll sort of have their, you know, their antenna up for unusual things. And that's how, you know, we've detected um, or found a lot of, um, you know, breaches, not because there was something really obvious going on, but because there was something really strange going on, but subtle. And the fact that it was detected early meant that it wasn't going to become a, a bigger issue. Mm -hmm. So um, let's talk about multi-factor authentication because that really is kind of the number one thing. There's Every security professional will, will basically tell you that if you have multi-factor and encryption, you're pretty much, you know, preventing yourself from being um, 
packed. And uh, so let's talk about how multi-factor works in uh, in Office 365. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so this is kind of the end user uh, experience once the administrator has kind of enabled an account for Office 365. Uh, or multi-factor authentication in Office 365. So there's a prompt to open the web browser to go to uh, https aka.ms slash MFA setup. Go ahead and enroll the computer or enroll the device in multi-factor authentication. Our recommendation is that you use the mobile app. That is the most secure option. Um, you can also, you can choose to receive a phone call. If maybe you uh, you know, on your desk phone, for example, if you don't have a, a mobile phone, you can choose to receive a text message. However, text messaging um, has, has kind of proven to be susceptible to kind of some other attacks, and so it's not considered as secure uh, as using the mobile app, the Microsoft Authenticator. Um, so once you go through the enrollment process of uh, linking the, mobile, the Microsoft Authenticator on your phone, to your Office 365 account, um, then go ahead to the next slide. Whenever you log in, uh, to Office 365, you'll get, um, you know, here we have an example of, you know, you go ahead and sign in, uh, and then you'll get a note saying, hey, we've sent a notification to your device, please respond to continue. So the way I have it set up for myself is I receive a, what's called a push notification, so my phone buzzes when I log in and says, hey, we've detected uh, an authentication request, please verify. And I can hit approve or I can hit deny if it's something, if I'm not in front of my computer, you know, if something seems strange, if it's in the middle of the night, whatever, I can hit, you know, deny and it'll, it'll block the uh, request. So, um, so that's how the uh, kind of the end user experience is for completing the multi-factor authentication. Um, so those are, I think, We've talked about the fundamental controls. There's a whole set of kind of additional or advanced security controls that can be uh, implemented as well. Uh, and I'd be happy to you know, take questions about that or you can um, follow up uh, kind of out, uh, outside of this uh, format to talk about the advanced security controls. But um, we are starting to see more organizations be interested in information rights management. So this is essentially like encryption or kind of controls around files. So practically speaking, you could uh, apply certain policies to certain sets of data so that, uh, for example, if it gets forwarded outside the organization, it's not available. Um, you know, if you don't want something, you know, on the front page of, you know, Breitbart or uh, the New York Times, you may want to uh, put some controls on that data uh, as a way to kind of put a fence around it so that only the right people have access to the information. Um, you can include controls around OneDrive and in terms of who and how, like what IP addresses can access that information. So again, if you're moving from an on-prem environment to the cloud and you wanna say, hey, we only want people to access files when they're at our office in the network, you can put restrictions so that only approved IP addresses can access data or only domain joined computers can sync files. So you don't have to worry about, you know, people um, you know, syncing it on their home computer and then what happens when they leave and that kind of thing. Um, with Intune, you can set a more robust set of policies around device access. So you could say, you know, if you're going to connect to our organizational data, you know, we need to have a pin code on your device. Your device has to be encrypted. We need to be able to uh, wipe the data if you leave the organization. So there's controls that you can have around uh, devices. Um, and then finally, in that E5, the EMS E5 SKU, there's the Microsoft Advanced Threat Protection and Advanced Threat Analytics, um, which is really a way to kind of unify all of the security logging and metrics into the Microsoft Security Graph, which is kind of what they call their, like the backend, uh, backend uh, data collection AI system. Uh, so it can do event management and correlation kind of across all the endpoints. So, you know, Microsoft is kind of uniquely positioned to be able to provide uh, telemetry from your computer and what's going on there with login events on your identity and you know kind of services that are connected to it. So, um, so those would be some of the advanced uh, security controls that could be implemented to provide you know kind of greater insight and uh, you know reporting. And again, I think this is a great example of kind of the power of the cloud. Uh, if you have this on-prem, your on-prem Active Directory, it's you know very difficult or impossible to provide really uh, clean reporting and management and auditing uh, without an extreme amount of work. You know, you can turn on and set up a lot of this stuff, you know, in a relatively short amount of time. 
So let's take a look. I think we have a couple more slides, and uh, we can take a look at you know what what some of the stuff looks like before we have a few minutes for questions. Yeah, and I think we one of the things we want to do is just we talk we've talked a lot about safeguarding the data, but um, the monitoring of the data is also very important. So talk a little bit about some of the tools that can be used um, to monitor. Mm -hmm. um, so as identify like kind of mentioned early, uh, once you have Azure Active Directory uh, that kind of P1 set up, you can uh, configure monitoring and use Power BI. So for Power BI, this is a, a great use. Um, so there's a bunch of pre-built uh, content packs available. The one that's really relevant is the Azure Active Directory logs, and so this provides uh, insight into kind of what's going on with authentication requests. So in the next slide here, uh, we have kind of the screenshot of uh, the insight that's provided. So again, uh, it's kind of, this is the big picture view. Maybe we can zoom into some of these sections, but uh, you get some insight into sign-ins over the last 30 days. Uh, you can drill in and look to uh, sign-ins by location. So, you know, where where are accounts logging into, uh, device sign-in by browser type, by OS type, the applications that people are using. Um, you know, here along the right-hand side, we see the total number of sign-ins, the total number of applications that are in use across the organization, um, how many unique users are there, who's resetting their password, has anybody failed their password reset? Um, again, so there's a lot of insight that's available. This is all, it's pretty cool. You can kind of drill down into all these areas and do filtering, um, and it makes it a lot easier to try to like figure out what's going on uh, as opposed to like pouring through an Excel spreadsheet and pivot tables and, and that kind of stuff. So I certainly appreciate this, you know, uh, as kind of my workflow as part of a, a breach response. Uh, I'm immediately turning this on, getting it connected, and using it to do uh, incident reporting and analysis to try to figure out, you know, what accounts are accessing the system from an unusual location uh, or a strange, you know, time frame or something like that. So, um, so that this Power BI content pack is is really powerful. Um, and then the another tool that we talked about at the very beginning was the cloud app security. Um, so this will contain some similar information as the Power BI content pack. Um, but it kind of combines, you know, kind of some of the static reporting of, you know, who's accessing one application uh, with some policies and kind of workflow and remediation response. So again, uh, if you have somebody log in from a geographically distinct location, you can kind of trigger some workflow like issue a multi-factor authentication challenge or block that account or do something else. So um, it really provides some kind of actionable security response, uh, you know, against you know, information that's available through the through the you know the the back end logging system. Again, you can classify risk levels or users, what IP addresses are people accessing, you know, which applications are folks using, not you know just Office 365 apps, but also, you know, hey, you know, is why is Dropbox being used at this organization? You know, we've moved a box or or kind of vice versa as a way to provide some insight into the the traffic and the the files that are being um, used in the organization. Yep. All right, so we're nearing the end of the uh, of the webinar, um, but we do want to leave you with some uh, links to additional resources that you can avail yourselves of um, to pursue these tools to learn a little bit more about Microsoft's approach to security, as well as uh, what they provide for nonprofit organizations. And we'll include these uh, with the notes as well. Um, so before we get to questions, and thank you all for um, your attention throughout this webinar, uh, we want to highlight next month's webinar. So it's kind of the companion piece to this, or if, if for whatever reason you find yourself in the unfortunate situation of having experienced a, a security incident, what's the best way to respond to it? So um, hopefully none of you have, have gone through that, uh, and hopefully none of you will. But um, kind of in the vein of a disaster recovery plan, it's great to have you know a playbook in place so that you know having a, a security incident happen to your organization is very stressful. And if you have a playbook, if you've done some uh, preparation and planning in advance, you're going to be in much better shape for um, responding to that security incident. So we're going to talk through some of the things that you 
uh, should do if if you happen to experience a security incident. So that'll be next month. Mm -hmm. All right. So with that, we'll move on to Q and A. We have a few uh, questions here. So thank thank you to everyone who who submitted questions and uh, appreciate your patience um, in giving us time to respond to them. Um, so with regards to passphrases, so one of the things that you had mentioned, Matt, was that um, you know the new sort of password orthodoxy is that you use um, memorable passphrases that are long, somewhat unusual, uh, rather than sort of complex string of characters and numbers. And the question is, you know, can you use passphrases beyond Microsoft's 16 uh, character limit? What what are some of the limitations that Microsoft places on um, passwords. Yeah, and so I think this is a, a moving target and I'll actually be curious to see what they um, say at the, the conference next week about this. So currently the restrictions as I understand it are there's a minimum of eight characters and a maximum of 16 characters in terms of your you know uh, password length. I think it may be a little bit different if you're syncing it with your on-prem directory, um, but if you're kind of in Office 365, kind of from a pure cloud perspective, that's the limit. Um, I've just started seeing uh, there's some password uh, rule kind of previews where you can um, block certain words or phrases, um, you know, in the password. So, you know, people, you know, couldn't use, you know, your organization acronym, or you know certain things that maybe you know you kind of find people using on a regular basis. So so that is the restriction right now is a minimum of eight, maximum of sixteen. Um, and again, we're the the goal here is kind of longer is better um, because we're talking about you know kind of either brute force like trying random combinations. So uh, we we want it to be easy for you to remember, hard for a computer to guess. Um, and so that's why the longer uh, that a password is, the more combinations theoretically that a computer has to try to guess it. So that's some of the kind of the background uh, thinking uh, and analysis in terms of password length. Um, and it is likely, I mean, there's a big long feature request at Microsoft to kind of extend that character limit, um, you know, to, to kind of meet, you know, NIST I think is, you know, saying you could do passphrases up to 64 characters or something, but that's the Office 365 limit right now is, is 16. Okay, and then uh, if an organization, so this has to do, you, you had mentioned DMARC and DKIM, the new DNS records for really verifying um, email identity. If an organization has SPF records set up in their DNS, do they also need to um, configure DMARC and, and or DKIM? Yes, they do. And um, it's pretty straightforward. Office 365 supports supports them as kind of a, you know, as a as a as a as a service. Um, so then there's they will generate the records. You uh, will then put them into your DNS host. There's some special uh, places to to put those records that Microsoft provides. Uh, and then and then there's some kind of reporting or kind of action handling. So I think that also need to be configured. So. You know, right now I would say you know DMARC and DKIM are kind of in that same place as SPF, where it's it's a good it's a good idea. Uh, adoption is improving, but we're maybe still not at the place where you can uh, turn it on fully to say you know unless an organization has a valid DMARC and DKIM record, I'm going to reject it. Um, you know, we're not quite there yet, but I think it's going to be an important tool you know in the in the tool belt to help uh, cut down on some of the spoofing uh, that's going on. Yeah, agreed, agreed. All right, well, thank you, Matt. I really appreciate your time and appreciate everyone who attended the webinar today. Uh, this was very informative. Um, as I mentioned before, we're gonna put the recording on our YouTube channel and we'll put the slides on our SlideShare um, site and the links will be on our website. And we definitely encourage everyone to join us next month for the Security Incident Response Webinar. Have a great rest of your September, and uh, we will see you next month. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Take care. Community IT does these free webinars and podcasts for our community, and we love sharing our knowledge and experience. If you have more questions or are having trouble with your IT at your nonprofit, please get in touch with us on our website, 
www.communityit.com so we can start a conversation or schedule an assessment. Downloading any of our free resources there will get you signed up for our webinar reminders, and you can attend our next webinar in real time and ask our experts your own questions. If you love podcasts, please subscribe and leave us a rating to help others find this leadership resource for nonprofits.